After June 16, the fight against apartheid took a whole new direction. The photo of Hector Peterson, a schoolboy who was gunned down by the police in Soweto, was published worldwide. Britain is up to its neck in apartheid. And that's why we're here today. The global community began to put pressure on the ruling National Party to end racial segregation. The government, however, responded to political dissent with even more lethal force. Paul now operated in a different area of law enforcement. At some point, you were tasked with targeting particularly white South Africans Correct. who were against apartheid. Tell me about that. I never really worked with black suspects or colored suspects. Um, very limited experience in that area. I worked on the white left. I eventually recruited informers, which ended up in white organizations, white anti-government organizations. Um, the official course that I went on in security course in police college, I went back after getting police training. Now as a security cop, about 70, 80 of us did a very, very extensive high level secret course. And there we were taught everything across the board, the whole gamut, the whole scale of, of intelligence, intelligence work, spying, if you will, from micro dots to counter-surveillance, surveillance techniques. The current belief at that time was that black people couldn't organize rioting or insurrection or the liberation struggle unless it was whites behind. You can see how deeply apartheid was entrenched in the thinking of the powers that be. So the white left wing in South Africa was seen as the ultimate enemies. Um, whether they were in churches or underground members of the, of the Communist Party or the ANC, these are the people that had to be taken out and were actually the focus of, of the, the white rage. Many of the political activists were brought to the building in front of me. Today, it's known as the Johannesburg Central Police Station. Back then, it was called John Foster Square. Here, the police used any means necessary to extract information from their detainees. There was 10 steps given about the process that you take a detained person under. The first thing was inst installing them absolute fear or terror and break down their resolve and this was done by number one on the list the one that was the least visible and dangerous and threatening but worked but it took time was of course sleep de deprivation and if this didn't work in itself while he was kept awake um, the techniques would be added to to exhaust the person physically and mentally they would be made to force to perform um, physical acts, running on the spot, uh, balancing on bricks or planks, um, having to crouch in a squatting position, and at the same time being subjected to a barrages of questions and allegations and stuff. But the torture did not end there. In every police station in South Africa, you had what were known as PPR bags, prisoner's property receipt bags, which is a heavy cotton bag um, that any prisoner, person arrested for a crime or otherwise, the personal property was placed in this bag and a label was put on it. This fits over most human beings' heads. This would be pulled over the detainee's head and water would be thrown on it and Firstly, you were totally blacked out. There was no light coming through. And secondly, you couldn't breathe. Um, and then various refinements of this. Um, the ultimate interrogation or, or instrument of terror was known as uh, affectionately as Radio Moscow. It was a little generator with two wires. 
which uh, was held against a person or attached by crocodile clips or whatever it means. And then this generator was then spun. Um, these generators were used to shock the person. And it's, a, it's a, a system that's very effective and it also doesn't leave marks if you know what you're doing. And then there was the reverse of these stages where the person was built up again in a way that you wanted them. Um, prime prizes in this whole thing was to use them to testify against their fellow travelers or their fellow members of the cell or whatever they were involved in. Uh, there was also the possibility of turning them to the point, and this happened right across South Africa, turning them into one of you, where you had the later phenomena which came from the Vamberland of the so-called Ascaris, people that were caught um, and turned and eventually became one of us. Throughout the interrogations, what was your conscience saying to you? It was a fight to the death. My conscience did worry me. And I, I'm very happy to tell you, and I'm very proud to tell you that my colleague and I, he's now passed on. And many of us would, would go and purposely work towards not hurting. That was our bottom line. I'll give you an example. There was a woman that was giving us particular stick, an activist by the name of Dawn Ingle. And our boss sent us the one night, and, and our job was to like literally scare the SH1T out of her. Um, he's kind of suggested in that roundabout way, like toss a couple of petrol bombs through into the house and take out the motor car. And we went there, first checked to see that there was nobody. I mean, this is like half past two in the morning. We actually went and checked that there was nobody just on the off chance having sleeping in the back of the car or maybe one of her kids was <laughs> with her boyfriend in the back of the car. We actually went and looked. I just think we got to a stage you didn't want blood on your hands. You know, enough was enough. We are talking here about people with feelings, emotions, people who had families. Could you not stop yourself from continuing to do some of these things? Well, I did. Um, I, I might have done it earlier. I tried to leave in 1986. I did the artwork, uh, the design for the Johannesburg Centenary, and which was eventually then destroyed politically. And I was on my way out of the police, and when this thing fell flat, and I wanted to finish my degree, but it became too much, and I started to fall apart. But I did leave. I was the youngest security, uh, the youngest policeman, I think, in the security police that ever left. I went on pension at 37 years old. I ended up in hospital 14 times. And it wasn't surprising that Paul's health would be negatively affected. Think about it. A job that includes tortures, bombings and killings is obviously abnormal. I think with most people that are non psychopathic is that when you're subjected or exposed, sorry, um, to death and destruction like I was, is you get two phenomena. You either get attracted to that type of stuff or you try and avoid it. In, in my case, and I, I thank the good Lord for this, I <laughs> avoided it as much as possible. You know, taking a person into a room and, and beating them to pulp or shocking them was not something that, that I was too happy with. And while doing such a job, is it even possible to have a normal family life? What did you say to your wife after, <laughs> after hours when you arrived at home? What did you talk about? Yeah, what did you do at the office today, honey? Oh, I killed one or two people. <laughs> We're going to bomb... A restaurant next week and blame it on the ANC because we were also doing things like that. It was very difficult because she was astute and clever enough to know a lot of what was going on. Um, there were times that I even brought informers for lack of agents, that is, into my private world and my private life. And um, 
she'd sort of read between the lines and that. But generally, it put enormous, enormous pressure on, on her marriage. For more, go to ewn.co.za.